Now, meeting of the Shreveport City Council is not being called to order. Uh, we will have an invocation by Councilman Willie Bradford, and we will have Councilwoman Lavette Fuller to lead us with the plea. Right, Let's pray. Gracious Father, we come again thanking you for another opportunity to come before uh, this city as we transact the business of the city. As we meet today, Lord, we ask that the uh, meeting would be decent and in order. We pray your blessings upon the mayor and of all these council members and those that partake of the governance of this city. Direct us, guide us, we pray. It is in thy name we pray, amen. 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 Mr. Flag, join me in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, Indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Madam Clerk, will you call a roll, please? Councilman Bradford. Present. Councilwoman Fuller. Present. Councilman Nicholson. Present. Councilman Butcher. Here. Councilman Flurry. Councilman Green. Present. And Councilman Bolton. Here. Tomorrow I obtain a motion to approve the minutes of the uh, February 25th and 26th council meeting. And there's also an amendment, Mr. Chair. And the amendment. Um, to the city council meeting on the 26th, February 26th. Any council member have any awards or distinguished guests that they'd like to recognize at this time? Mr. Chairman, if I please, uh, I, don't, I don't have any, any special recognition. I, I did want to acknowledge, in a sad way, uh, the death of several people that uh, passed away since we met last. Uh, one of them was the, the brother of uh, uh, our former uh, City Councilman uh, Hillary Huckabee, Howard Huckabee, Howard. he passed, and then uh, another uh, elected colleague, uh, once upon a time, Mr. Carl Pearson, who was who served on both the Paris Commission and uh, and on the school board, and there were several other, but, but one one I want to acknowledge particularly, who, who was one of who was the next thing, distinguished educator, but she was one of the greatest women that I have ever known. And her name was Mrs. Isabella Simon Sanders. Uh, an absolutely wonderful lady. We feelize her as, as uh, on Saturday as well. So I just wanted to ask that you would uh, keep those families in your thoughts and prayers. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right. I believe Ms. Sanders is Lennis's uh, aunt. Yeah. yeah, Ms. Sanders was uh, our, our eternal auditor, Lennis's okay. steward, and very, very, Respected woman in her neighborhood, in her community. Okay. Nice to see Leonard's back there. <coughs> I see you. Okay. Yeah. Any other council member? Uh, anyone from the mayor's administration? Um, not at this time. The mayor will be on his way shortly. He had a flight delay, so as soon as he lands and can get in this direction, he'll be here. All right. Uh, Mr. Green. Terrence Green. Anyone has anything for Mr. Terrence Green? Not Council Member James Green. How you doing? Anyone has anything relative to property standard for Mr. Green? All right, seeing none. Thank you, sir. We have a revenue collection plan from Ms. Jones. Uh, should I have that by tomorrow? Um, I emailed that, um, I think it was early, late last week. I I should have that tomorrow. And the attorney, I'm sure the one we got that from the report. Ms. Jones, will there be any legislation added tomorrow? Not that I'm aware of. All right. You have any requests to speak? Uh, Mr. Chairman, we we'll first have Matt Schneider. Matt Schneider? 
Wow. Uh, let's see. Size it up real quick. Mr. Snyder, good afternoon. If you state your name and address, please. Yes, Matt Snyder, 640 Albemarle Drive, Shreveport, 71106. Okay. Um, so I'm here to represent Crawfest at Betty, Virginia. Um, it's a, we're in our third year. We have a resolution in front of you today. Um, we're asking for some support. Um, I met with Shelly Rago about a month ago, and we had a meeting where we went over things that the city could help Crawfest continue to grow. Um, each year we've grown. Um, our first year we, we had a very small budget, about $30,000 put up by me and my partners um, exclusively. And we were able to, to make it work. Um, the next year we wanted to grow it even more. We had about 6,000 people that first year. Um, after that, we grew, and in our second year, we had over 10,000 people in an eight-hour event at Betty Virginia Park. It's the largest gathering we've ever had in the park that we know of. Um, we had people all across the park enjoying the park together, um, and we want to grow the event to two days this year. We've expanded our spend. We have gone from last year, I think we spent around $40,000, and this year we are our budget is somewhere around eighty or $90,000. Um, our music budget alone has gone from $7,500 this last year to about $26,000, bringing um, regional act Ivan Neville and Dumpster Front from New Orleans Friday night, bringing a great regional act um, on Saturday from Austin, Texas, and also bringing 100 pieces of the Grambling Marching Band to perform along with many local acts throughout all day set Friday from 4 to about 10 and all day Saturday so we think we're providing a really great service to the community um, as our crowds are growing we are needing more and more support to keep the, the event safe and with that we're on a tight budget of trying to make it work to keep the event free to the public and so we're trying to get support in the way of barricades tables and chairs police shuttles um, and I think you can see that through your resolution okay. um, in discussion council member um, my first question is what sort of organization is pinpoint media um, my company is called pinpoint events LLC right, pinpoint events so that's an LLC it's not a 501 c3 that's correct okay have you ever requested this sort of assistance from us before no I've not okay. we, we have tried to in all our events uh, we have six events um, and we have tried our best in those events to grow them over time um, on our own own funding and like I said we're looking at about an $80,000 budget and this would help us in about probably about $12,000 save us about $12,000 of the risk um, the big the big thing on this event is we want to grow it and make it something truly regionally important is if there's one day that's a real bad weather event or whatnot we're, we're very nervous that we could lose a, a, a lot of money on this and not be able to, to do it um, and we've seen that the community really loves it and it's coming out um, we are already have eight uh, over 8,000 people interested are coming to the event this year Um, but I guess the, my concern is that you're a, a for-profit organization. Do you do you recover? You you put a lot of money up front, but is anything? And it's a free event, but it's not everything is free within the event. Right. There's so how do you and recover your funding? Sponsorships and sales of, of beverages through the event. Um, we did an event, a first year event last year called Big Skin in the Park. Tried to provide um, showing football games in Betty Virginia Park, funded ourselves and lost $8,000. Um, so it's a very real risk um, that we're willing to take. When we got together and formed our group five years ago, the idea was to create cultural events in our community that would bring young people back to Shreveport. And that's what we've done. And in our minds, we have to keep growing this in event and to keep growing it in the in the path we need to grow it, we need some support um, to help mitigate some of the risk. I mean, my goal is to keep growing this every year until it's a truly big regional music festival in Bay Virginia Park. That's it. For now. 
Councilman Butcher. I yield to Councilman Nicholson. Councilman Nicholson. Uh, Mr. Schneider, first let me thank you for being here. Uh, Crawfest is in Councilwoman Fuller's district, but it's not far from where I live or from the boundary of my district. And I, I certainly have received a, a great deal of positive feedback about the event uh, over the past couple of years. I, I think the council's concern is that we have a consistent policy regarding the, the assistance that we provide to for-profit entities, and that's, uh, that's not really something for, I think, you to uh, tell us is something we have to decide for ourselves. And I, I certainly favor uh, giving Crawfest whatever support we decide uh, is, uh, we can give to other for-profit entities who want to provide similar services to our community. The one thing I can say on that is, is I did, I sat with Shelly and we went over other examples um, throughout time and she came up with the list. It's not like I just came up with, hey, let's ask for this, this, and this. Shelly and I went over examples of, from many years back of things that have gotten these things year after year and it's individually. Um, the, one, the one big difference and when we sat down, just to be clear, is we made a decision in the early years before we did our first event, which is Shreveport Derby Day, and the idea was if we do this as a for-profit business, for say, we can drive more of the money back into the event. We're not paying each other salaries. We're not doing any of that. Um, we are taking the risk to try to do something really special for Shreveport that can continue to grow and grow our culture to bring young people back to Shreveport. Um, there's, you know, a, we could talk about nonprofits and salaries and overhead and all that, but we're not taking out like that. And you can see that in our proposed budget that was set. Yeah. Well, look, I, I appreciate that, uh, Mr. Chairman. I think the council or, or several of its members need to talk to Ms. Ragel and get her input, right. but I, I hope we can reach some agreement. Because she's on vacation right now. Right. Um, and the, the request for information that I sent out, the only example that was given to me as far as a partnership with a private entity like this. It was um, Sports Spectrum with the runs and that we do barricades for that and that we have our agreement for like Ju the 4th of July Festival at TBS, and that's also on this agenda. Those are the only examples. All right. Councilman Boach. Uh, Mr. Steiner, thank you. Um, I'm like Councilman Nicholson. Uh, it's not in my district. However, I think you live in my district. and. Uh, <laughs> So um, <clears throat> I, I applaud y'all. I, I know a lot of people that, that attend your events, and, and they're always top-notch, and I think they're an asset to the city. Um, my concern is similar to Councilman Nicholson and Councilwoman Fuller's. We're at such a fiscal impasse at the city right now, asking for fees and trying to raise fees. And if, if everybody could understand the phone calls and the emails that we get on a daily basis begging us not to to do things and to cut. Um, I am uh, I'm inclined to, um, to help in some way, but I think that the city uh, and this council is gonna have to come up with a, um, a more um, equitable way since we haven't ever done this really before for a private entity to this, to this scope, to this extent. I know we have for like she said, Sports Spectrum and everything. And I, I have not seen a copy of your budget. Is there any way you can make, email it to all of us? I think about what you mean. Yeah. Um, but anyway, I just think it's going to take a little bit more. Um, and we have, is this a two read? No, we're, we're actually up upon like the event yeah, the in less than two weeks. Yeah. So. What number is that? 28? Uh, 26. Resolution 26. Yeah, we won't be back before that. Um, okay, okay. We're, we're just going to have to, we're going to have to discuss it and, and decide which direction we want to go. I just, I'm, I'm kind of like uh, the other two council and, and councilwoman that, that, that I, I just don't know if we need to, we hadn't set this precedence yet and I'm afraid that we may set a precedence that might be uh, costly to the city. But I do see the value of your event and I see the value of what you're doing. So that'll definitely be weighed. So. I mean, and I'll, I'll leave it with, I mean, I hope the president, president can be set to look at the value of events in our city instead of looked at nonprofit or not or whatnot. We had 10,000 people come out last year. If it rains this year and I lose $60,000, Crawfest is over and I lose my house in right. your district. So that's what you're really looking at when you look at that is how much of, we're talking about $12,000 probably that will come off my budget if you pass it as it is out of an $80,000 spending budget. 
So please look at it that way, that I'm asking for a little bit of support here for a big event that's growing every single year, that's adding a lot of value in tax dollars and in cultural importance to the heart of our city. I mean, so I, mean, I really I hope you'll look at that as what it is. I want to reiterate, I, I definitely understand the value of your event and other events um, and the impact that it has on the city. So um, we're just going to have to look at it. And I, I just think that from this point forward, since there's nothing in place that we've never had this set before, we're going to have to look at it as a council and say, okay, this is what we'll do for private public, you know, events such as this, because just because, um, your events bringing in success doesn't mean that the next person that comes in is going to bring in success. And if we're, you know, 12,000, 10,000, 11,000 here, when we're already out with our hand, almost like, um, panhandling, um, it makes it kind of hard, you know, that's so. why the suggestion would be to look at each event individually on what it brings to the city and not make a that's, that's sweeping as sitting here. That's a very hard sell though, to, right. to tell somebody else, well, you know, the Sny uh, Mr. Snyder's event is, is a very good, well-planned event. We have faith in you. I mean, you do a good job. There's no doubt. I have results yeah, as well. Yeah, but what's to say if uh, somebody comes in and says, well, I'm going to do this and it's going to be great, and then we lose X amount of dollars and they don't bring anything in. So, I mean, we could discuss it forever, but I, tell, I just want to let you know that uh, it's going to take some thoughtful consideration. We're gonna, I'm, I'm going to think about it very thoughtfully. So, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Mr. Right, Council, Councilman, uh, Councilwoman Fuller. I want to add that when we discuss results, results need to be measurable and it's helpful to be able to say, okay, well, the return on investment is this, that this is how many, that this is the amount of revenue that's coming into the city, that this is the amount of hotels, that uh, the beds that, that came in or people that came in and got hotel rooms for us the, for, for that night this is how much more money came in that festival weekend that was in retail sales as well as the tax revenue. From the numbers that you gave me, you, um, that you all pinpoint paid 2877 in sales tax 2018 for this event, estimated vendor sales tax of 4,500 in sales. So total estimated sales tax of $7,377, but we're looking at a $15,000. And, we're, and we're, doubling, we're doubling the event. So and we're going to two days, we're growing. But in, in the two we're, years, we're looking at two or three years versus an ROI that we can see from other events that we've worked with, where we understand cons the consistency of what we're getting from that, and we understand those relationships. So I'm all for having consistency for applications or proposals that come to us, but I think that we need to have all of this out in front of us while we're making these considerations. Um, I appreciate you sending me your budget earlier when I requested it, I do. And I also wanna go on the record, I do I enjoy your events, I enjoy attending your events, but again, you're asking for dollars at a time when we're looking at every single place that we can cut and I'm not, able to completely justify what the return on investment is back to the city other than that you're providing a cultural event but that I don't have enough information on your outcomes and your numbers as far as the dollars coming in for us to be able to say without a doubt that this is what we need to do if it's going to set a precedent where every other festival that comes through here is going to ask for the exact same thing I don't know if we can afford that and that's exactly the precedent that's going to get set has there been a precedent set on nonprofits in that same way? Well, look, look, Mr. Now, let me suggest that uh, you and I, and Mr. Knuckles, and any other members who want to participate continue this discussion. I think some of the reluctance and conversation you're hearing up here has nothing to do with Crawfest, which is, I'll say, a really fantastic event uh, for Shreveport. Uh, it has to do with the fact that we're just all concerned about budgetary constraints and the council has not yet done the work of establishing the policies that we need to put in place. That's that's no fault of yours mm -hmm. or Mr. Knuckles. That's that's our responsibility, and we're going to do that. Okay, right. Councilman, that, Councilman Green. Nothing on that. I just I have a comment, okay. brief comment. Bradford. Yes, sir. Mr. Bradford. Yes, sir. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Councilman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so, tell me your estimation of the economic impact that these two years have had on the city. Now, we understand um, what you said earlier, but, but if you look at other, other equations, 
what 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 you think this has had on this? It, it would be an absolute guess. Okay. Um, but I can tell you, we had 10,000 people in Betty Virginia Park last year. We're bringing in regional acts from across the country. Um, this year alone, I will be buying over 20 hotel rooms. We will be bringing lots of bands, and I'll be renting close to $3,000 in buses to bring the entire Grambling marching band over here. I'll be feeding the entire Grambling marching band while they're here. I will be spending just on my $80,000 that's on our budget um, that we will be spending to put on the event. There's an economic impact uh, right there. As long and we're going from eight hours that, as as Councilwoman Fuller said, that we created about $7,500 in tax. We're going to two days, so hopefully that would be would double. Um, and I think it, it adds a great quality of life aspect to the entire community. When we looked at it, we wanted something that was diverse across the city and that would bring Shreveporters together in the park to be together. And that's why we're, we're working across many lines and with a lot of partners to really bring a, a yeah. cool event. To and I appreciate place. that. But, but again, that doesn't answer my question in this sense that uh, I don't want to guess on a number. No, I mean, I, I mean but I, I mean, but you, you, you gave me some, 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 some talking points that I could consider. Yes, sir. But I'm looking, I'm looking at local versus outside. But you know, the, the expense that you're asking the city to incur is is, 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 heavy. You know, at this time, and I agree with the council members. So tell me this: How many vendors are in the park selling selling their products and goods? It roughly, will be around 30 vendors. 30 vendors. Yes, sir. How much revenue do you think that, that would that would create? That's like probably sixty, seventy thousand dollars in one day last year. And and now we're going to two days. So so these vendors would be making a tremendous profit. Hopefully. Yeah. I mean that's their that's their incentive. That's their kind of, that's their incentive and that's their goal. Okay. So uh, if all goes planned and, and we do a good job of bringing the right entertainment and the weather cooperates and everything, yes, local people can make money and we can do well all together. But there's a lot of risk associated and there's a lot of cost to make the event perfect for the people to mitigate parking issues. I mean, one of the things on there is the shuttle people from Mall St. Vincent. Um, that makes the quality of the event and the quality of the experience for our citizens better. That we have that. No, I think I think we again we're not disagreeing with the the um, the outcome of, of the event in in regards to what you expect and there's factors whether and so forth that will cause some some the, some downturn. The biggest thing I would say is there's only so much I can recoup by selling drinks. And by sponsors. So when you look at the festival and you look at costs like how many shuttles do we want to have and how many police officers are going to have and a setup for lost children and barricades and everything, there's only so much money that we can plan on recouping. So there's only so much money we can spend. So, so you're getting, so we're you're asking the city to help with barricades and tables and chairs to mitigate some of the costs that we would have in shuttles and what. So, so let me understand, and I'm finished. Uh, you got sponsorships. I do. What, what level of sponsorships are there? Um, we have sponsorships from fifteen thousand down to two hundred and fifty dollars. What What do your vendors? What do you charge your vendors to? to Our do? vendors pay twenty five percent of what they what they sell. What they sell. And I, I do that because I want it to be fair. I don't. If we have a bad day and it rains and I don't want anybody losing money. So even with your eighty thousand budget projection, you still may make a profit. Yeah, we could. Yeah. Hopefully we will, yes. But, but yet the city uh, would be obligated in another way that, that, that you would consider. I think we're asking for about $8,000 in hard costs from the city. Okay. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, Mr. Vice Chair, one, one, uh, one question I had is, does the city, and I don't see it in here, does the city charge anything for the park, or is that that $5,023 for the uh, to spar? Does anybody know? The park right now, when you do events in Betty Virginia Park, no matter who you are, there's not a fee okay. for that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. But there will be some liability if, if something happens. I cover the insurance. We yeah. have to. We have requirements of insurance and whatnot that we okay. meet. Okay. Okay. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. All right, Mr. Knuckles, please. 
Wow, Mr. Knuckles is on his way up. Councilman Green? Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to recognize Pastor Brian Hollins, who's um, visiting with us today. Welcome, no, Pastor. Uh, Chief Hollins. Chief. Chief. Yeah. <laughs> Mr. Knuckles, a member of the media requested that speakers be asked to stand behind the red line and maintain so distance from the microphone to, to improve the quality of the audio for the viewers at home. <laughs> as long as I don't break their camera, I understand. Uh, and I'm sorry I didn't come with my partner. He's probably about ready to, to kill me. But uh, I'm, I'm one of Mr. Snyder's partners, Grant Knuckles, 8690 Line Avenue. I'm in Twisted Root in Shreveport. <laughs> Um, I, I did want to focus on a couple things. We're the, the largest free music festival in North Louisiana. We're the fastest growing festival in, in North Louisiana. And uh, another resolution on this very docket from KTBS is 50% uh, more um, cost that they're requesting at staffing, uh, about $30,000 in cost. Um, they're for profit like we are. Um, I would imagine their ratio is about the same of ours as far as ROI. So as you're looking on your numbers on this very budget, uh, or on this very docket, please look at that as well. Um, our resolutions are almost identical in terms of what we're doing, quality okay. of life, et cetera. All right. Have Thank you. Come on up. Thank you, Mr. Nook. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, I see no further requests to speak. All right. Now we have the following executive appointments to be considered tomorrow. Uh, that would be Chief Administrative Officer, Ms. Sherecca Jones, as far as Division Manager of Administration, Chair of Rome, and Fields Operations Superintendent Herman Hill III. Is Mr. Hill here? Mr. Hill had That's a work emergency, so he won't be here today or tomorrow. Okay. All right. Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. I'm sorry. Councilman Brown. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I, I have an additional question for Mrs. Jones, if you will. Yes, sir. Ms. Jones, on last uh, meeting, I asked you uh, in regards to uh, the reserve fund as you, as in your position as the deputy CEO, which you were responsible for helping develop the uh, budget, uh, about your concerns, and you said you had many concerns during that period. Is that, is that, was that your answer? Um, I did state that I did have a concern about the reserve when I began in that position as the assistant CAO. Okay. And, and, and through your seven years, uh, how, how, did, how, how, how did you, and what did you offer to, to help uh, sort of uh, create and maintain a, a, an operating reserve in, 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 in your role? Well, as you are aware, the reserve still needs some bolstering to get to an amount that would meet what's the best practices. Mm -hmm. um, during the time that I worked with the budget, um, in each year I would provide my analysis of, of where we are um, with conservative estimates on our revenue and expenditures mm -hmm. and where that reserve, reserve amount would be. Um, and then from that point, you know, of course I rely heavily upon um, the the policy that's driven by um, you know our leadership to get that number to where they feel comfortable but from from my perspective I, I do provide very conservative estimates okay and do you recall the average of those years that you was participating in in uh, creating uh, the administrative budget before it came to the council what was the average reserve fund balance that was there do you, do you recall um, for the past few years, um, we've had a reserve that's hovered right between one and two million dollars in our I'm sorry, annual I didn't audit. Hear that. Say it again. We've had a reserve in our annual audit that's ranged from about one to two million dollars for million. the past okay. couple of years. And and that 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 would be consistent with where we are now. Um, well, our projection is about three million, which. We're expecting to increase reserves. Yeah, I mean, but that, it, it, it came. It came from the from the 2019 proposed. Correct. Yeah, but there was years that 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 that, that number was not was not sufficed. It wasn't. It wasn't. It wasn't established and, and maintained. Correct. Yeah. Okay. So, in your official capacity, in relating these these concerns to the to the administration to the mayor specifically. 
what, what, what was the response? How did you, what was your, your, your opinion about their concern to that, to that, to that um, low, 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 low reserve count? Um, they agree. Um, you know, and Liz, on all of our presentations to the council, we have noted that the reserve amount should be a certain level that we were not quite, you know, at that level. Um, of course, you know, in doing that, because revenues have been stagnant, you know, the expenditure side is the next position that we need to start to look at very closely. Um, and that's going to definitely require us to, you know, make some tough decisions. Okay, and Mr. Chairman, I, tomorrow I, I have a follow-up question with the mayor as well, because Councilman Nickerson asked the mayor what process did he use and how many applicants was, for that position was, was actually uh, provided, provided resumes, and, and there was a process to, 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 to uh, reach the finalists, and I just, I just want to follow up with a question for him on that. Okay. Okay. And that's on tomorrow? Yeah. Okay. okay. Councilman Nichols, sorry. Hey, Mr. Jones, I want to follow up on something you just said in response to one of Councilman Bradford's questions. Uh, the the projected operating reserve for 2019 is about $3 million, is that right? That's right. But uh, you indicated that the audited financials for the past several years, which are retrospective, of course, looking mm -hmm. backward, uh, which uh, I, I might not have known before I showed up at the council and studied up on this. Uh, but the audited financials are the documents you get after the fact, and they show you what reserve you actually had. had. And you're telling us that for the past several years, the, the actual reserve or the actual margin that we've been operating on has just been one to two million dollars. That's correct. And, and what's, what's our total general fund budget? Um, the general fund budget is about 220 million. So, so that, that's, don't you agree that's a razor thin margin? I agree, Councilman. Uh, um, the the projection that we have for the 2019 budget, the three million dollars, um, we haven't gotten you know close to completing the audit yet. But because we had a very good year for sales taxes, I'm, I'm confident we may come close to that number. Um, but as far as the audited financials are concerned, we have had about less than two million dollars in reserves, and that is your unassigned balance um, according to. Um, Gatsby. You know, I, I just, uh, I have to say, and I might say this every two weeks for the next four years, uh, that that margin uh, of reserve causes me great concern and, and just, in my view, is not responsible for a municipality our size. That is something that the council and the mayor uh, have to win and the CAO have to work together to address this year. We have to come up with a plan moving forward to avoid uh, uh, margins that thin. Thank you. All right, Councilman Bush. Um, Ms. Jones, what um, I know that uh, Councilman Nicholson sent you a request for some uh, unfilled positions. What have you come up with a number on that yet? Budgeted but unfilled. Yes, I I did send that um, to Councilman Nicholson um, just right before the meeting. Um, and in, in total, you know, I didn't calculate what it is for the general fund, probably citywide for our non-civil service salaries is, was about nine million. Of course, that includes water and sewerage, airport, um, our, our enterprise funds. Um, but if, again, that number, whatever amounts are not filled, becomes a part of our fund balance at the end of the year. Okay. So, I mean, it kind of saves us money you know, at the end of the year if those positions aren't filled. Um, but then again, sometimes those positions aren't filled because, you know, the salary ranges aren't at a point where we can get applicants. Okay. Um, last, last year's budget, um, did, we, did we budget more than what we had anticipated bringing in? For? For, 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 for 2019, I should say this year's budget, but during the budget process in 18, did we budget expenditures higher than what we thought we were going to bring in? Um, our, we haven't gotten the actual results for 2018 yet um, because sales taxes did so well they last were good. year. Yeah, that's good. You know, I, I think we actually under budgeted. See, in, in your, I know that you're the previous CAO kind of, um, from what I understand and looking at things, that he was very conservative 
on on some things. Um, you know, trying to make sure, and I think it's always good to to undershoot a budget and you know to make sure that you've got the money you need in there. Is that going to be your philosophy as well? Um, to kind of um, I don't I don't know the right word to say, but I mean we're going to try to get the numbers as close as we possibly can. I guess is what I'm going to say. And when, whenever you're CAO, you're gonna you're gonna try to get the budget budgeted numbers as close to actual as you can, right? Yes, okay. I'm. You know, the, the finance student in me doesn't like to look at things from a hopeful perspective. Um, I kind of like to look to look at reality and budget what we've seen before, you know, versus kind of hoping that things will, you know, increase, um, which we don't, you know, know if they would. Um, in general, I take a very conservative approach to budgeting. Okay. I think, I mean, that's a, that's, that's a pretty good policy. I'd rather um, undershoot it than overshoot it. So. Okay. Thank you. All right. There are no items under consent agenda for introduction to be adopted. Ms. Jones, would you uh, proceed with regular agenda uh, legislation, please? Yes, uh, resolution 24 is to launch a city council investigation as authorized by section 4.29 of the city of Shreveport, Louisiana Charter. Resolution 25, authorizing the execution of a cooperative endeavor agreement with KTBS LLC. Resolution 26 is authorizing the execution of a cooperative endeavor agreement with Pinpoints Events, LLC. Resolution 27 is authorizing the execution of a cooperative endeavor agreement with the Shreveport Bossier Sports Commission. Resolution 28, authorizing Bruckner Truck Sales, Inc. at Greenwood Road and Rice Road to make a connection to the city of Shreveport's water system and to authorize the mayor to execute a contract between the city of Shreveport, Louisiana, the town of Greenwood, Louisiana, and Bruckner Truck Sales, Inc. in accordance with Section 94-7 of Article 1, Chapter 94 of the city of Shreveport, Louisiana Code of Ordinances. Resolution 29, amending portions of Section 2 of the Shreveport, Louisiana City Council Rules Procedure. Resolution 30, to urge the mayor to meet with the play ball Shreveport for the purpose of entering into an agreement to renovate and operate Fairgrounds Field. Resolution 31, to request the mayor to authorize the Human Resources Director to open an administrative inquiry into complaints made by employees of the Shreveport Fire Department. Um, um, I'm looking at 24 and, and 30, well I see 31, I guess that's different. 24, Councilman Bradford or Ms. Jones, can you explain that more in depth to me on 24? Mr. Chairman, let me, let me speak on that. Uh, I, am, I, I will be withdrawing this resolution tomorrow okay. and replacing it <coughs> with uh, Resolution 31. Okay. Uh, as you remember, uh, the council office advised me in my haste to get this resolution uh, that I, I, I uh, omitted certain uh, certain parts of, of the civil service uh, law that uh, that would have somewhat um, prohibited us from forming a committee out of this body. So um, after research, we, um, we determined that uh, a more plausible resolution uh, from requesting from the, uh, from the, uh, from the proper uh, Authority would be would be most um, applicable. So, and I'll speak on that when we get to 30, 31. The third one. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. And okay, that's fine. Councilman Butch. Um, I would like to remove uh, resolution thirty. Do we need to do that today, or we need to do it tomorrow? Tomorrow. tomorrow? Okay. I, I plan on uh, after talking to uh, Chairman Bowman. I believe we, there's another route that we're going to take. It's not off the, it's not off our radar by any means, but uh, we're going to take another route. So for right now, I'm going to use Councilman Bradford's word in, in my haste. Um, <laughs> I, I think we want to remove that. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councilman Butcher. Councilman Nixon. Mr. Chairman, would you please briefly explain the purpose of Resolution 29, which I have sponsored? This concerns amending the rules of procedure to change the date of the election of the chairman and vice chairman. Sure. The city council rules of procedure as currently written uh, take into account that the um, council members will elect a chair and vice chair 
um, at a time when the election code was written differently. And so now uh, that the election code has uh, a different time period when you all are elected, um, this resolution, I mean, I'm sorry, this, yes, this resolution will uh, amend the council rules of procedure to have you all be elected um, at the first meeting in January as far as uh, when you elect your chair and vice chair. So, so previously the general election date was earlier in the year and when that was the case it made sense to elect the chair and vice chair at that time we're just changing our rules of procedure to bring the timing of that election in line with when the election now occurs yes sir thank you Chairman, Councilman Bradford let me follow I, I want to speak on 31 but I want to speak on on the, on the uh, rules of procedure as well because I I didn't I didn't see it earlier okay even though the, the, the and I'm, I'm not at all opposed to the modification, but through this uh, prohibits the council up, up on the, the, the circumstantial situations uh, to, to elect the chairman at any point of the year? Uh, uh, if I may, Mr. Bradford, it's not my intention to change that. And I don't think this, this rule of procedure modification changes our the fact that the chair and the vice chair serve at the pleasure of the council. Yes. That's my understanding, Ms. Strand, is that correct? That's correct. In section 2.2, uh, the term states the last sentence of that, that the chair and vice chair shall serve at the pleasure of the city council. Um, there is, we have revised um, to where there's a clarity now about absence from a meeting versus vacancy of the chair or vice chair during a term of office. Um, if a vacancy was to occur during a term of office, the person selected as the replacement chair or vice chair shall be appointed only for that unexpired portion of the original term of the chair or vice chair. And we made some clarifications there. Okay. Okay, Mr. Chairman, and finally, um, on, on Resolution 31, um, the modified and replaced document. Um, like I say, previously, I had intended for the council uh, to establish a, a investigative committee, and, and in further review of the of the uh, uh, of the uh, civil service uh, laws of procedure. And the reason my haste was that, and again, it's kind of it's kind of difficult. And, and and I've also reached out to some other some other governmental entities. The charter is clear, I thought, when it said that this body has the authority to investigate all departments of the city of Shreveport. And all means all. I thought I thought it was inclusive, but there are some statutes within state law as well as the civil service law that sort of gives us uh, some some obstacles so the 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 wording of the of the of the of the civil service where it says only the appointing authority has that has that uh, authority of the investigation of the firearms uh, had had me to get with the council office as well as the clerk and, and uh, sort of came up with this new uh, ordinance or uh, resolution rather that, that we thought would fit would fit the, the intention of what I'm trying to reach and what I think need to happen in the city and that is that we would ask the mayor request the mayor uh, t to uh, ask authorize the Human Resource Department to to create a confidential process in which uh, persons could come forward and make their and make their complaints or allegations known but the issue is and I also have the, the council office researching and I should have some information tomorrow regarding the 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 the, the, the outsource <coughs> attorney services fee as well as other fees that has been occurred and has been paid out by the council by the, by the city for services that has been um, as a result of 
of um, litigation and, and other civil service matters uh, that we have no, no, we have no real recourse to correct with, with these laws in place. For instance, we have occurring thousands and thousands of, 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 of legal, legal bills with appeals, and we are paying those. But we have no real, the council itself has no real ability or, or authorization to, to try to make that right, to, to bring forth remedies. So I reached out to some state legislators. And I'm, a, and I, you know, I mean, it's, it's a, it's a big thing. I mean, they really, they really got our hands tied. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm of an old school where, uh, if, you know, if you're paying, <coughs> if you're paying the freight, you know, we ought to at least have a say on who's going to train. <laughs> but, but we, but we're paying freight, and we have no, 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 no real ability to decide. Not, not only what goes on the train, but what's on the train, and 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 I'm I'm, I'm trying to I'm trying to work work out a scenario where one of my state legislatures, because the session is coming up, and he says it's still time to get something in, to, that will that will sort of release some of that some of that uh, hope that that we that we have that we can't do some things. So, if you remember, at the last meeting, the mayor spoke on Resolution 24 and said that if it's the desire of the council that this would be investigated and he has no problem with it. So, so as, the, as the appointing authority, uh, I would ask that we support this tomorrow and request of the mayor to authorize the human resources to take action to, to try to uh, investigate these matters. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right. Just, um, and I guess that'll come out or come through in, during that process, but I was just wondering if they, if any of these complaints, and I'm sure most of them have, if not all, but I just want to be clear and make sure that they did go through the proper channels. Yes. As into the uh, immediate supervisor on up to human resources and then um, further if needed. I didn't, that's what I was, I just want to make sure that we, we're not over, overstepping. Well, I, I, I see think, you going. I think, again, Mr. Chair, I'm not, I'm not asking, I'm not, I'm not asking for any disparate action <coughs> from, from, from this resolution. Okay. Okay. It's a, it's a, it's a, I mean, I've personally, and I said, I would not reveal any names or, or correspondence, but I think if the process is, 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 would be created and, and, and it'll be a confidential process, and those that have, have issues or have complaints or have been, feel like any part of this statute has been affected in them, then they would have, a, they would have the right okay. and ability to come forward, and once those report that report has been developed and reported back to the council or to the mayor. Then, then we can look at providing some some legislation to remedy some of this that's, that's happening. Okay. But I'm not a, at all. I'm, I'm, I'm going to repeat. I'm not at all asking for any disciplinary procedures to be started against anybody. Okay, got it. Councilwoman Fuller. I'll, I'll yield to Butcher and come back. Councilman Butcher. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, um, I think the complexity of civil service is, is um, kind of difficult to understand. Um, I think that the, the biggest thing that we need to understand is if we're investigating the fire department, that means we're investigating the chief, which the chief's rights fall under the Firefighters' Bill of Rights, which gets into civil service. And so we need to, we need to walk uh, a very fine line whenever we go into investigating. Now, having said that, if there is wrongdoing in any department, civil service-wise, I agree that the council should have some type of oversight but I think that that's going to be a very uh, detailed legal matter that, that I, don't, I would not want to take up because I don't want to ever deprive the police chief or the fire chief of their bill of rights that are set forth in civil service. Um, and then you've got, you know, it just trickles down because if there's problems going on at a, at a battalion chief level to a, to a shift level, all those people fall under that, that Bill of Rights and have to be given the same. Um, they have to have a PDC. They have to have all these different kinds of things that, that fall into this. And uh, I just don't know. Um, I just don't know where we can go as a council uh, other than funding wise. I mean, we can always not fund something, I guess, you know, because we hold the purse strings. But um, I would hope that we wouldn't get to that, to that point. But civil service, I, I learned. Uh, 
for being a fire chief for 11 years of a civil service department. Civil service is a strange animal. And you better have your ducks in a row. And uh, the reason we've paid so much out in uh, attorney fees and fighting this is because civil service is so complex. So I, I just, I, I wanna, uh, I agree with, uh, with Councilman Bradford's intention here, but I just wanna make sure the council and the city and the administration make sure that we're depending a lot on Ms. Strand and Ms. Creel to give us guidance on this. Um, I personally would feel better having um, our own council taking care of this instead of subbing it out to somebody um, because this is such a, it, it's just, it's a convoluted mess when you start digging around with, with uh, civil service. And I think Ms. Strand, you probably have seen that. So um, anyway, that's just my two cents worth. I, I, on the, I believe that if we have employees that, that feel like that they are uh, not being treated correctly and they have followed the chain of command, which is outlined in their SOPs and SOGs, then we owe it to those employees to dig into it. But we, we just have to be real careful with what we do. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right. Thank you, Councilman Butcher. Councilwoman Bullock. I'll wait. All right. Ms. Jones, would you proceed with introduction of resolution? Resolution number 32, declaring the intention of the city of Shreveport, state of Louisiana, to proceed with the issuance of not to exceed $100 million water and sewer revenue bonds in one or more series, making application to the state bond commission for approval. Resolution 33, employing professionals with respect to the issuance of the city of Shreveport of not exceeding 100 million of water and sewer revenue bonds in one or more series for the purpose of paying the cost of making additions, extensions, and improvements to the combined drinking water and wastewater collection treatment and disposal system of the city. Resolution 34, declaring the intention of the city of Shreveport, state of Louisiana, to issue taxable water and sewer revenue bonds in one or more series in an amount not to exceed $20 million for the purpose of paying a portion of the cost of construction and acquiring additions, extensions, and improvements to the combined drinking water and wastewater collection treatment and disposal system of the city. Resolution 35, employing professionals with respect to the issuance by the city of Shreveport of not exceeding $20 million of taxable water and sewer revenue bonds in one or more series for the purpose of paying the cost of making additions, extensions, and improvements to the combined drinking water and wastewater collection, treatment, and disposal system of the city. Mr. Chairman. Uh, we've been informed by Bond Council that Resolution 32 and 34, which declare the intention, uh, are one readers, or they can be adopted as a one reader. Uh, we think that's right. We'll look at the charter again, but if so, uh, it's our intent to put them on the agenda as one readers for tomorrow. tomorrow. That does not mean the Council is required to adopt them, but they will be available for adoption. Uh, unless there is some objection by a council member. Okay. All right. Councilman Nooks. Uh, there's been discussion in recent weeks about the fact that the consent decree work uh, to repair a water and sewer system is going to cost hundreds of millions of dollars more than was initially estimated. The initial estimate was in the range of $350 million. The council has now been advised that the total cost of that work is likely to exceed $1 billion. Uh, my suggestion is that before the council proceeds with approval of the issuance of $120 million of additional bonds, we need to be fully apprised of how the initial $350 million estimate was put together, what data was considered, and what analyses were performed. Uh, understand why the estimate is now more than a billion dollars, and have explained to us thoroughly have explained to us thoroughly why uh, these additional bonds are necessary. Uh, I understand that the present administration is not responsible uh, for the generational neglect of our water and sewer system that necessita necessitates the work uh, that has to be done to that system, uh, but we must understand why uh, we're being asked to spend, uh, it sounds like almost $700 million more than was initially anticipated on this work. 
Uh, so th those are my comments as to resolutions 32 and 34. I hope even if those resolutions are determined by the clerk of council to be one readers that could be adopted tomorrow, uh, that we will defer adoption of those resolutions so that we can all make sure that we have the information we need to make an informed decision about approving the issuance of bonds in that magnitude. I also would like to comment briefly on the city's practice uh, 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 or process rather for selecting bond counsel. You know, the issuance of $120 million of bonds uh, will require legal work for which the city will pay hundreds of thousands of dollars. Uh, my goal uh, for the city in its selection of bond counsel, as with every other type of professional uh, that the city hires, is that we hire the best qualified people who are willing to do the work for an acceptable fee. Uh, the, the consequences of uh, legal error uh, in a bond transaction could be tremendous for the city. Uh, and without naming names, I will give one example. Uh, one of the lawyers proposed to serve as disclosure counsel on a $100 million bond issue. Uh, so far as that lawyer's website discloses, does personal injury law, family law, and criminal defense law. And I don't say that to disparage any lawyer who does that work. Uh, I've had a general practice, litigation practice for a number of years, uh, and I've done a variety of work. But serving as disclosure counsel and, and meeting the requirements, the very serious and stringent requirements that the Security and Exchange Commission imposes uh, for the lawyer who fills that role is specialized legal work. Uh, it is not something that should be uh, given uh, to a lawyer to do for any reason other than that lawyer is qualified to do the work and is the best available person to provide that service to the city. Uh, for that reason, I've suggested to my colleagues that we consider implementing an RFP process, a request for proposal process for selecting bond counsel and the other professionals who provide services in connection with the issuance of bonds. Uh, I circulated this week to my colleagues a request for a proposal that the city of Atlanta uh, in Georgia issued uh, for bond council services and, and I suggest that following that process would be an improvement to the way we have done things uh, to this point in Shreveport. Thank you. Ms. Jones. Yes, um, I want to note a couple of things. One, that on tomorrow uh, during the mayor's comments we do have a presentation um, that we will have uh, done by our city engineer, Patrick Furlong, um, to update the council about the consent decree, and we'll be able to answer your questions during that time. Um, the second thing, I just want to also make comments um, regarding the, the councils, that the fee for bond council is set by the attorney general of the state, um, so we don't have any control or ability to um, make any adjustments to what that fee is um, because those attorneys and if, if it's a co-counsel arrangement um, the maximum fee is set by the state. Um, I also want to note that the professionals that we have in, involved with these transactions um, they have been working with the consent decree since the initiation in 2014 um, and then prior to that, they've had a total of 12 years of experience with doing municipal bond work. Um, so we do feel confident that they are able to do the work. Um, they've do, been doing a very good job of handling the tremendous workload um, um, with our bond transactions. All right. Councilman. Uh, this is a question to which I don't know the answer. Ms. Jones, you may, or, or somebody else around the podium may. Does the state law you just referenced set a maximum uh, fee, or, or does it mandate that lawyers who handle bond transactions are paid uh, the, the fee referenced in the statute? It, it does set a maximum fee through the attorney general based upon what type of bond it is and the transaction size. Do, doesn't preclude negotiating for a lower fee, does it? Oh, definitely not. No. And it, it doesn't require us to have uh, more than one set of lawyers serving as bond counsel, does it? It doesn't require um, a co-counsel. Okay. Thank you. All right. Councilman Boots. Um, Ms. Jones, typically in, uh, in these bond issues, what, what does the co-counsel generally do? What's their purpose? I've done probably, I don't know, 
five million dollars worth of bonds and the fire department and I did we just did a 12 million at 911 we had one council and we had the financial advisor which is now mandated by the state what what does this co-council do I, I'm this this to me is just completely foreign why well, we have to have a co-council when we already have a a bond attorney could you explain that to me sure yeah we we definitely see um, co-council arrangements um, it's kind of getting two heads for the price of one um, because the, the bond council fee is split between the two of them um, the Attorney General does not provide for those councils to duplicate their fee um, so it gives us the benefit of having an additional level of expertise on our bonds um, and especially for the consent decree we think there's some value in that what though specifically if the bond attorney is um, we specifically used uh, and I know the parish uses a certain gentleman out of, out of New Orleans that pretty much does everything um, what and I know there's some local companies now that have set up here that, that do bonds um, what specifically would that that bond co-bond do I mean are, are they, I know you said we get you know two two for one but I mean what what will their job task be separate from the contracted bond attorney? Well, the, the co-counsel that we have employed, um, well, proposing to have employed, um, you will see them at the council meetings for every bond transaction to make sure that the council's questions are answered. <coughs> Um, they also prepared the legislation that is on the agenda and submitted it to the city attorney's office for um, consideration for the agenda. Um, they will be preparing the state bond commission application fee and communicating with state bond commission, answering their questions um, regarding the transaction. Um, they also will be assisting with preparing the, don the bond documents and making sure that we're in compliance with, um, with bond laws. So the, that's what the co-counsel will do? Correct. All right, thank you. All right. Councilman Nicholson. How are the fees allocated between bond council and co-council on the basis of, of relative work perform or on some other basis? Um, I can find out that's an arrangement that in those individuals negotiate between themselves and how they will do that workload. So I can find out for you. So the, the, the lawyers negotiate that split? That split, correct. And the city doesn't have any role in that? That's correct. So, is there any reason we couldn't require that uh, the, the fee be split in proportion to the work performed if we're going to have council and co-counsel? Um, it is my understanding that it would be split in that manner. Um, I don't know what that fee arrangement percentage is, but I can, I can find out if that's your question. Has the fee split been fixed for the uh, resolutions that are on our agenda tomorrow? The, the split arrangement? Yes. I can find out. Okay. Could you tell us that tomorrow, please? I will. Thank you. Sure. All right. Um, when you, Ms. Jones, when you spoke about the fees, can you speak again on that so I can uh, make sure everyone, someone didn't get it, and I want to make sure that we were uh, clear on who sets those fees, um, how those fees are set. The, the Attorney General's office has a fee schedule that determines what the fee can be um, on a maximum level. Um, depending on what type of bond it is and the size of the bond transaction. Okay. Mr. Chairman, just one follow-up, if I could. Yes, um, so we cannot negotiate less than what that AG fee is. I mean, we can't negotiate. If we went to ABC bond attorneys in, you know, downtown Shreveport, we couldn't negotiate for a lower fee with them. Um, I'm sure there's, you know, room for negotiation. I, I haven't seen... Um, cases where we have asked the bond attorneys to accept less than you know what their fee is so long as it does not exceed exceed what the attorney, attorney general recommends wouldn't that kind of come into what councilman Nicholson said about the RFPs that if we did you know go out for RFP is that what you were talking about councilman Nicholson uh, uh, yeah, councilman butcher I think an RFP process would allow us uh, both to obtain the best available professionals uh, and to negotiate on price okay their that, that's, that's where I was going I just want to make sure that there was there was no, no law against us negotiating these set fees and to everybody's knowledge I don't think that there is is there to, to negotiate a lower fee mm -hmm. that might be something we might want to look into tomorrow to make sure that 
I, 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 say I have a I have a fair degree of confidence that the attorney general sets a maximum fee for these transactions. But, okay. But does not require that that fee be paid. Okay. Thank you. Did the city attorney have something? Or no. Okay. I remember that question was brought up uh, a few years back when we were, I forgot the name of who we were dealing with at that time, and then um, shortly after when we s switched over and started using another bond council. So that was brought up, and we ended up, and from my understanding, those fees were cheaper, uh, lower in cost, but um, maybe we can get those numbers and get some comparisons in, in cost from what we had then and what we're doing now, too. So. Sure. Um, Ms. Jones, we can proceed with ordinance on second reading and final passage. Ordinance 26 to revise Article 4, Division 3A of the City of Shreveport, Louisiana, Code of Ordinances, relative to the duties and responsibilities of the Deputy Chief of Police. Is, is that a deduction of 26? What can just read? That's number 26. You know, what might help is if we're paying attention to the class instead of having a sidebar. Do I suppose to ignore my council person if he gets a question? Do y'all need to be separated? Because there's a seat over here. Mr. 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 Chairman, here today. Mr. Chairman, ask the council lady to, to quit picking on me and council. <laughs> I would just like for everyone to be on the same page so that we don't have to ask folks to repeat stuff. He just pulled me over there and I didn't know what to do. <laughs> <laughs> All right, <laughs> but I, I was reading. I was reading this uh, uh, a minute ago, and I can explain what what was the rationale for this. And can can somebody give me a clear understanding of what this? Because it looked like it's it's redundant. What, what's the chief's coming up? Okay. Yeah, so uh, this is another one of those civil service issues. Um, we have a classification for deputy chief of police written into ordinance. We also have the classification or the, um, the rules under which our deputy chief operates within our general orders. And then there's a civil service classification for civil service law that promulgates the, the rules for deputy chief of police, what their job function is. And there's some discrepancy in civil service law regarding the wording for deputy chief of police and the ability for a, the appointing authority being the mayor and the chief to appoint a deputy chief um, when, or excuse me, let me back up. When we talk about the deputy chief of police classification, it's a second in command to police department. Wording allows for the deputy chief of police to fill in for the chief of police in the chief's absence. Okay. Now the intent, as I understand it, from the city's perspective, is if the chief is out temporarily, week vacation, week sickness, uh, training at another state, the deputy chief of police can fulfill the duties of a chief for hiring employees, terminating employees, signing um, things that only a chief can, can di dictate. In the case of where we face ourselves right now, uh, Alan Crump is on extended leave and it, the city does not believe it was the intent of the deputy chief position for the classification of deputy chief mm -hmm. to fill in for chief of police for an extended amount of time. Civil service law allows for the provisional appointment and for substitute appointments of a chief when the, the permanent chief is out for extended leave, which is the position I'm in at this time. So there was some debate uh, in the last, well, there's been some debate in several civil service hearings about my appointment and why the deputy chief could not fulfill this role. Now, currently, it's not possible because we don't have a deputy chief. Um, but prior to Chief Gooden retiring, there was some discrepancy is because the statute currently says the deputy chief shall, and we want to reword it in that the deputy, deputy chief can fulfill the obligations of the chief of police. But again, it's not intended for that to be for an extended period of time. And I hope that clarifies. It's a little confusing. It does. And this would remedy that. It would remedy, remedy it from the city's perspective. We cannot change the civil service wording. That would be up to the civil service to do that. Yeah, okay. That's what I meant through from yep. the city's. It, was, it would remedy our ordinance, and we would, the police department would then remedy our um, general ordinances, our, our standard operating procedures, once this ordinance, was, assuming this ordinance is passed by, by the council. And just curious, have, 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 have the previous uh, ordinance prevented you from 
carrying out any responsibility that you feel you was deserved to be carrying out? No, it has not. And uh, it's caused some um, discrepancy amongst the board members. We've, we've had some, we've had quite a few hours of uh, <coughs> conversation about whether the deputy chief should have been in this position from the beginning or, or not. Uh, and this is this is some of that. This is to try to keep the, prevent this from occurring again. Okay. To, to my understanding, this, this in the history of Shreveport, you've never had a position quite. We never quite had this position where the chief was out on extended leave and you had a provisional appointment such as this. That's true. That's, okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, uh, Councilman Booth. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, chief. So basically, I'm looking at the civil service law right now. It says. Um, the deputy chief of police assists the chief in planning and then it goes into him being on in an absence shall serve as the chief in an absence back in 2012 or 13 miss phils jones you may have to help me with this um the police department i mean the fire department was out without a chief between chief mulford and chief wolverton for about a year and a half and the deputy chief ro jones stepped in and took that that role is that that correct yeah somewhere about 2015. Now, how many years did the chief jones serve as the deputy chief but was the chief in charge it was about a year or so wasn't it i, I can't recall off the top of my head so the city the city head. has set a precedence for that for the deputy chief to step up well and i may be incorrect and correct i apologize ma'am i believe within the fire department the deputy chief is promotional it's competitive in the police department and that, that does change things from a civil a service bit. perspective um, here's here's what my number one concern is uh, you know and I, do you have intentions of filling the deputy chief position since chief good Gooden's gone uh, between now and in July yeah I'll answer that one councilman we do uh, he's wearing three hats right now and I mean we all know the accelerated timeline that he had going from that CAA position to the um, chief position and he's done a very good job while he's been there but He's not Superman, and uh, it's affecting the operations of the police department with only him uh, up. And I know that because I'll email him at midnight, and he'll email me back. Right. So, here's here's my concern: if 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 you add, you know, with Chief Crump, and you know, we're talking about possibly having to make cuts in some areas, and we're the ones that are going to our constituents saying, "Please give us seven dollars. Please give us eighteen dollars," but we're paying close to $412,000 a year right now if we include the deputy chief um, for the administration of the police department. And I just think until you make a decision on the chief, maybe it's it, it's a good idea for us to unfund that deputy chief position at least until July. Uh, that would save us, uh, I think that uh, Chief Gooden's base pay was 102, that's what I was sent. Um, that would at least alleviate a little bit. That would give us from February to July um, to, to do that. I, I just, because uh, I'm assuming that you're going to fill your former position as well, right? The That's correct. Yeah, we plan on filling both. Uh, my, I, I guess my rebut back to that is, um, again, it's disrupting the operations of our police department. We know the situation that we have been in historically with public safety, and is that something that we want to sacrifice? So... We started this deputy chief position in 2012, correct? Correct. Okay, prior to that, I know the call volume was, was probably about a little bit higher back in the early 90s. Um, I guess I'm just saying, can we wait till July? I mean, we've been, I mean, can we just wait till July but we're not paying that extra $102,000 a year? That's, that's, a big concern for me especially considering that we're we're really every day asking our constituents for more money and to me it's a good show of faith let's just wait I mean we did it from when the police department started to 2012 and then we create this deputy chief position and in the deputy chief position and this is just a layman looking in in the deputy chief's position it says that he will fall in and take the role of the police chief in his absence we still have a police chief which is Chief Crump, but we're going to put another guy in, and so we're paying all these different people. And it just, to me, it's just so, um, I, I don't know, as a taxpayer, it irritates me more than a councilman. I just would rather just wait until July and let's get our police staff in, in line. And I'm not saying that, because uh, I think you got a test coming up in May for chief and then a deputy chief. 
we got a deputy chief test coming up in March, March the 11th. Well, the, or the April the, the 11th. I believe they're going to be in April. The, the, the posting is over, so people had to turn in their resumes. The actual test has not been set. So uh, realistically, by the time you get the test back in May, you're only going to be looking at two months. So I mean, I'm not against y'all starting your selection, but I would rather not fill that position until we have a, a permanent chief. That's just my sense. Yeah, and Councilman, I completely respect your, your opinion about this. But, uh, again, it's just something that I'm not willing to compromise with with the uh, integrity of the operation of the police department. And when technically we're only adding one person. Chief Gooden has since retired. Uh, so we're technically adding one person. And ideally, you're right, uh, but we didn't ask to be put in a situation where our police chief is on extended leave. So we're that, trying to work with that and do what's best for the police officers and the citizens of Shreveport. I think that the precedence has been set by the city of Shreveport, uh, barring what, what, what Chief Raymond said about the, the, you know, the promotional and the, I think that it's already been set that the deputy chief can run a department. Um, I'm, you know, I, I'm just, I'm opposed to, to having, you know, these four positions right now, but, um, we'll, we'll just see where it goes. And I, I respect your opinion, Mayor. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Is that it for the Chief Raymond? Thank you, Chief Raymond. Sir. All right, now, Ms. Jones, would you proceed with ordinance on second reading and final passage? Ordinance 79, notifying Union Pacific and other interested parties that the city engineer and, deputy and director of public works through the office of the mayor are authorized to begin the process to reopen vehicular access to Lake Street from Commerce Street to Cyport Discovery Center, including reopening vehicular <coughs> access to cross over the Lake Street Railroad grade crossing. Ordinance 17, amending portions of Chapter 26, Article 5, Division 10 of the Code of Ordinances, City of Shreveport, Louisiana, relative to the creation and establishment of a solid waste enterprise fund. Ordinance 19, amending the City of Shreveport, Louisiana, 2019, Water and Sewerage Enterprise Fund Budget. Ordinance 20, amending the City of Shreveport, Louisiana, 2019, General Fund Budget. Ordinance 21, amending the 2019 budget for the Grant Special Revenue Fund. Ordinance 22 is amending the 2019 general fund budget. Ordinance 23, to amend and reenact portions of chapters 26, 74, and 94 of the Code of Ordinances, City of Shreveport, Louisiana, relative to a solid waste collection fee. Ordinance 24, zoning case number C-9-19, an ordinance to amend the official zoning map of the City of Shreveport Unified Development Code by rezoning property located on the east side of Marshall Street between 4th Street and Franklin Street, Shreveport, Caddo Parish, Louisiana, from IMU Industrial Mixed Use District to I-2 Heavy Industrial District. Ordinance 25 is zoning case number C-10-19, an ordinance to amend the official zoning map of the City of Shreveport Unified Development Code by rezoning property located on the southwest corner of Juella Avenue and Mervon Street, Shreveport, Caddo Parish, Louisiana, from I-2 Heavy Industrial District to C-4 Heavy Commercial District. All right. Uh, on seven, and, I'm sorry, Councilwoman Fuller. Thank you, uh, Chair. Um, uh, ordinance 79, based on the conversation we had in our infrastructure committee meeting last week, I'm wondering what our options are as far as either removing that tomorrow or tabling it. Because I think that the way we're going to end up moving forward is going to be to, um, a, it's going to be different legislation that will be keeping that road closed for at least the foreseeable future. So, so wait a minute, state that again so you may. Um, I'm wondering. I'm thinking that this is not going to be the legislation that we need to move on, and I may be requesting more that we remove it remove and, and possibly substitute a different resolution um, that would be possibly keeping that street closed for the foreseeable future. All right. And you still have been in contact and with the? Um, could we get the engineer to come speak? Thank you, Mr. Furlong. Yes, ma'am. I was just uh, wondering, what, what's the latest, or have we been in contact, still been in contact with any of the business owners over yes, there? Yes, sir, and, and we had a very good discussion about this in the infrastructure committee meeting. 
and uh, you know the the action that would satisfy everybody is a quiet zone. It's an official declared quiet zone by the the FRA. That's going to cost about 1.8 million dollars and about 60 thousand dollars a year in maintenance. So it, it it really doesn't look like that's feasible at this point. Um, the other two clear paths, clear options would be to close the crossing permanently or to reopen the crossing. Um, that, that gets into uh, preferences of individual businesses at that point. Okay. All right. That's what I need, That's what I need to know. Appreciate it. Thank you. Chairman, can I? Oh, I'm sorry. I was going to Patrick, can you tell, uh, so right now the legislation that was passed is expired, correct? Yes, sir. To keep it closed. So essentially, Councilwoman Fuller, and clearly can speak for yourself, but essentially we're just trying to be uh, in accordance with the legislation that was passed. So she's suggesting that we uh, extend it for the foreseeable future. Okay. Yes, sir. If, if you know, if, if we need a couple more months to, to figure out the, the final and permanent path, I do think a, a legislation for temporary closure would be appropriate. Okay. Okay. All right. That's what I, that's what I was asking. That's what I need to know. Councilman, no. The, the, the problem we have, Mr. Furlong, is that when this road was first closed years ago, it was anticipated that the cost of, of a crossing, which at that time we thought would satisfy everybody, would be in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. Correct. Now we know that to achieve the, the purpose of a quiet area, we'd have to have multiple closures with gates and that would cost, you've told us, almost $2 million and $60,000 annually, which uh, I agree with Councilwoman Fuller, it's just not a cost that we can accommodate at this time uh, unless there is some other source of money besides our budget. Is yes, that sir. all right? Yes, sir. That's Thank correct. You. Okay. Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. So, I'm sorry. so, so, Council Council Lady, uh, so is, your, is your preference to Great legislation that will that will that will continue to keep the like street closed until until we can figure out something more tenable for everyone involved. Okay. Um, what got discussed in our meeting was that the quiet zone would be optimal; that it's too expensive. But if we open that up, we're going to end up having other issues that we're going to that are going to come up again in particular with the Holiday Inn. So if you look at the revenue that comes in from that hotel, and you look at that being a noisy area, getting the bad Yelp reviews, all of that, losing the Holiday Inn brand, the flag, and what that will do as far as having such a large property there that would most likely, if we lose that flag, it would not be replaced with a boutique hotel. It would not end up being a Marriott or anything else. What it would be is a generic motel that is right there when you enter into downtown. And that is not good for, it's not good for our downtown. And it's not good for that, the tax base that, we were, that we'd be losing, that revenue that we'd lose. Okay. So the other side of it is that the other, the other merchants that are on Lake Street feel like they might be losing opportunities for revenue because the streets closed from Clyde Fan through Lake Street. But right now, what we might need to do is look at other ways that we can help them out or other solutions that allow us to keep that area qu as quiet as possible so that we can maintain the hotel and still find ways to get them traffic to their area. I think right now that's probably the most feasible way to move forward and so we can find a way to pay for a quiet zone, yeah. which would still take us a couple of years probably. The studies and everything else as well as the revenue to pay for it. And, I and mean, it's I'm, very frustrating for everybody involved. No, I, I, yeah. I understand and I agree with you because uh, Holiday Inn is still in the process of, of uh, renovating the other the other mm -hmm. properties, right? The, the owner for Holiday Inn also has the Best Western right there. Yeah. Okay. And the revenue that's generated would be compromised if we was mm -hmm. to open it up right now. Correct. Okay. I, could, I, I would support that. All right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, my next question was 17, 17 and 19 of those companion. 
Or how that what's how they work together. Mr. Chairman, I know 17 is mine and will create a solid waste enterprise fund. Let me review 19 and I'll answer your question if I can. Okay. I don't think 19 is it. Mm -hmm. that's the Looks like that's more for the division. That's the division. Yeah, that's something unrelated. That's, that's uh, it's ordinance 23 you're looking for. 19. It's 20, 23 and 17. Yeah, I, I believe okay. Ordinance 19 concerns uh, funds for a new position I, to supervise a consent decree. I see it. Yeah. So, Mr. Chairman, I, I see Councilman Green. He had to, he had to run. Uh, he said he'll be back tomorrow, so we can't get a statement on, on 23. Councilman, how do you see your 17 without a without a without a a fee a, a fee a fee proponent? Oh. Councilman Bradford, I'm I am uh, concerned based on some of the information I've received about implementing a solid waste enterprise fund without a fee sufficient to uh, to cover the costs associated with that fund. Uh, so that, that, that's. Uh, that's my present position, one of concern. Uh, that one seven of concern. seven dollars a seven dollar a solid waste fee does not uh, uh, comport well with an enterprise fund. But a seven dollar well, I know I'll reserve some questions to uh, Councilman Green, but to, uh, but a sub seven dollar to to address the concern of seven dollars which is to provide raises is not is not is not something that would be beneficial well I, uh, my view has been that uh, if we are to impose a solid waste collection fee uh, we should uh, impose a fee sufficient to cover the cost of the city solid waste operations and that we should also form a solid waste enterprise fund uh, passing a seven dollar fee would generate millions of dollars of revenue, part of which could be used to provide sanitation workers the raises that have been discussed in council meetings over the past two months. And in fact, that fee would generate substantially more than would be necessary to provide those raises to my understanding. Well, I have a follow-up question, but, but, but your position is that it won't sustain a solid waste fund. It, it, uh, it, it will not be sufficient uh, for us to have a solid waste enterprise fund without substantial transfers from the general fund on an annual basis. I see. Yes, sir. Okay, it's a two two prong approach. Okay, which is which is three million three point three point five million away from where uh, thought is needed to be. So. I get that. Councilman Butcher, go ahead. Well, since we're trash talking, um, it, has anybody looked into the recycling and that contract, Mayor? Y'all still, y'all still digging into that? Uh, yeah, we are, and um, we, you know, we we kind of want to give it to you one piece at a time. Okay. So we're, we're trying to see what happens here uh, before we bring it to the council on our with our suggestions. But I mean, we we are. I mean, it's no. There's no doubt in our minds we're going to have to renegotiate to something different, but we want to get this out of the way before we bring that forward. An option that, that, that's been floated to me and, and, and I've thought about, and I think some other councilmen have, have spoken about, and uh, if this does not pass tomorrow, which I'm not saying it is or it isn't, so don't quote me on that, but if it does not, is there any way that that 250 recycling fee could go? It would generate about $2 million, I think, or it generates about $2 million, 1.9, something like that. If we are able to get out of this recycling contract that we have, that I think we all, we may not always agree on everything sitting up here, but I think we all can agree that, that we're really not getting recycling. Um, in the meantime, until something else could come along, the $400,000 raise, could, could it come out of that $2.50 fee if we are able to get out of the recycling? I'll, I'll let Sherika like confirm um, my thoughts after I finish speaking. But I would say the 250, if it's coming out of the general fund, right. and we renegotiate or we terminate the contract, yes, then that would be funds that would be available to the to our sanitation workers 
However, another condition that we have to consider with that money freeing up is do we want to use money to pursue a recycling program? And I know we have a lot of passionate citizens that want us to have some form of a recycling program. So I don't want to say yes right now, but yeah, Sharika, can you confirm that that money is coming out of our general fund right now? Uh, that's correct. Recycling is coming out of the general fund. Well, you know, we, 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 we've said that this fee is, is critical in order for us to be able to keep our sanitation workers, and, and I agree. Uh, and and uh, they've been here on numerous occasions and, and have spoken to us, and I feel their, their, their need for a raise. I think that they definitely need a raise for the work that they do. I watched them uh, last Tuesday out there, and, and you know, it was raining and cold, and I could only imagine the job that they do. And they, they more than deserve a raise. And, and I think that the criticalness that was given to us, uh, you know, with this, this raise, and obviously, uh, or this, this, this clean city fee, obviously, you know, I'm not saying we're, we're far off. I think we're getting closer. I think every meeting we're getting closer, but I'm not, I'm not quite sure that we're there yet. I would like for us, if we are able to get out of the recycling, uh, take $4 million out of that. That would leave us $1.5 million to start pursuing other options as far as recycling. I think that one point five would be a good start for recycling, and four hundred could go to, to our, our sanitation workers, and that would be a quick fix to get them where they need and maybe at least stop the hole in this that part of the boat because it looks like to me our, our boat's been shot up with the AK and we're trying to fill all these holes and you know I mean this at least would stop that hole if we are able to get out of that contract so that's just something to look at and I want, I want you to know and I want to reiterate that we're definitely on the same page as far as recycling and we're definitely on the same page when it comes to um, to a uh, surplus, uh, we, we need a reserve, and I don't want you to think I'm fighting you on that. I just think that we may be going in different directions, but I think we're going to get to the same spot. It may not be tomorrow, but we're going to get to the same spot. So, yeah, thank and, you, Mr. Mayor. Thank and, you, and Chairman. Councilman, one other thing that can that is going to jump up on us um, if we, like I say, if we terminate this contract, renegotiate as far as expenses go is this subsidy, that $8.5 million last year. Right. The subsidy to sanitation is going to go up again next year if we don't do anything, if I, we, if I we agree. don't take I, any I, action. So that, that money, if we terminate contract and it generates funds, we, you know, you as a council might just approve a budget where those funds are just going simply to, you know, continue to subsidize our sanitation costs. I would like, um, and the chairman of the Audit and Finance Committee is not here today, but he will be tomorrow. I would like for him to, uh, if, if by chance, well, anyway, regardless, uh, I would like for him to call a meeting in the near future for and, and for you to attend as well, where we can all start putting our heads together to try to start sealing up these holes because we're taking on a heck of a lot of water. Thank you. I'm, I appreciate you speaking on the reserve. I thought people had forgot about the reserve fund right, for a I, moment, I, so I, we need to make sure that we keep that in mind. Uh, I wake up <laughs> in the middle of the night thinking about it, sir. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Councilwoman Fuller. Thank you, Chair. I knew I'd get another opportunity. <laughs> um, I wanted to just like restrict us to one theme for our analogies and metaphors for meeting. So and we had already stuck with trains, with the freight. What about the boat? So I know you, I, that's what I was gonna request, and I knew that, it would, that something else would come up, and I'm like, no. The, the, for the rest of the day, just keep it with, we got away from fruit, we're gonna keep it with trains. Okay. <laughs> Stay with trains. Councilman Breath. Mr. Chairman, uh, ordinance 19. Can, can, can I speak with the uh, engineer on that? Yes, sir. Now last meeting you, you, you kind of, you kind of exhorted the fact that this, this, this was a necessary position because the collective work of the engineers has been taxing. Is, is, is that the way it was? Generally, yes, sir. That? Yes, sir. So, 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 so supervising the consent decree work has been a shared responsibility. No, no particular individual has been responsible, totally responsible. No, it, it, it is tasked one individual. Oh, it has been tasked Yes, sir. It's the assistant city engineer over water and sewer. Okay. We have three assistant city engineers. Okay. Water and sewer, streets and bridges, and drainage and development. And this will, this will be designated just for that, that consent decree work? Yes, sir. It, it currently is designated to that one assistant city engineer. 
they're tasked with the day-to-day -day operations yeah. and I of course get involved as needed well uh, we have some very smart constituents they you know they don't come down but they email us and text us and all that other stuff and, and one of the ones that I heard from was very was very concerned about the price of that position <clears throat> what was the base salary we ran, we're running an ad for 95, the range is 95,000 to 120 base salary. Okay. And then. And, and we've, we've been running it for three weeks, we've gotten zero applications. And that, that's pretty typical with our engineering advertisements. So, so the 180 plus, I mean. So the, so the 170 uh, for the budget amendment, that includes retirement and health insurance that and, and the, the benefits. All the, all the fringe benefits. Yes, sir. Is that. Is that compatible to the to the other deputy deputy engineers? No, that's lower than that's what lower. it needs to be. Yes, sir. Uh, okay, it's lower than the private sector. It's lower than the Caddo Parish. It's lower than Bossier Parish. I pulled up before this meeting. I pulled up there some salaries. Uh, Caddo Parish, you know, their their public works guys are, are making well beyond what I make, and they're they're not engineers. Um, the Bossier Parish engineers making well above what I make, and, and that this is the level of person that we need for, for a job this big. The task is to oversee the program manager. The program manager, I had the uh, the roster with me. It's you know it's here's the ro the roster of the program manager. This is 44 people. It's a it's a very large contract that. that we uh, we pay on. It's a very large responsibility, and they're overseeing hundreds of millions of dollars of work, a little more than a hundred million a year. This is this is a major major investment that the city's making. Yet we have not made the investment at the top to make sure that we're doing it right. Baton Rouge, they had a very similar size consent decree, sure. a little bit bigger. I think they're at 1.5 billion. And they have a, a little bit more pipe, not not much more. Um, they had, you know, four people to oversee their their program manager. We we have one, and the the workload is just unreasonable for one person. Okay. So, so one more person is not. We need more than that, and we need to pay them better. But but this is a good start. So two two last questions and. They both worst case scenarios. You, you've advertised this for three weeks and you haven't had any response. That's correct. And if the council decides that the work can continue as 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 uh, as been, what's the what's the worst case scenario? What, we'll what, we'll stay what on the we, same trajectory. I'm sorry. We'll stay on the same path. And what is and what's that? We're, this is a, a large investment. A large mm -hmm. investment with hundreds with, of millions. With, without sufficient. Over a billion. Okay. It, we could save money. We could save a substantial amount of money if we provide a decent amount of oversight to this spending. So you're saying that this. this we can save money. I, 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 think, yeah. I think I saw Councilman Nickerson mention through an email or some communication that the overrun is, is going to be tremendous? You said it earlier, I think. Uh, Councilman, I, I did mention the fact that the, the initial cost projections were $350 million for the consent decree work, and I've been apprised and others on the council as well that the cost will exceed $1 billion. So the overrun will be quite substantial. Is this, a contrib is this contributing to that? To that, to that um, Not necessarily. The, the, the projected cost is that's what it costs to fix a sewer system this big that's what it costs the uh, the item that's out of proportion is that original estimate it was made off you know the, the best available data which was not very much at the time and that that's what was off the the cost of around a billion that's what it costs that's what it costs to other cities that's what it's going to cost Shreveport it's going to cost us at least a B that's what that's what we're estimating at and this point we but a deputy Engineer who's directly responsible for overseeing this project could save us a some substantial thousands. amount of money. Substantial amount of money. Yes, sir. Okay. 
but we don't have nobody targeted or any inquiries. I wish I knew somebody. I'd, I'd, <laughs> I'd call them. Um, the, the engineering market's very good right now in, in Shreveport. There's a lot of work. Uh, so there's a lot of demand with the private firms. Uh, there's a lot of demand for us. We have three vacant engineering positions right now um, that we have not been able to fill. We're, we're, we're looking at right size in our, our entire department. We're, I'm looking at every single uh, position and we're going to make those three engineers make them engineer interns. That's uh, when you graduate college you take a fundamentals exam and uh, then you get four years experience. So we're looking at somebody right out of college uh, and we're going to restructure everything going from there and hope, hope we can get some positions filled. It's, it's a struggle. Okay. All righty. Well, let's see. Okay. I'll turn the strain. My item was related to something else. So I yelled to Councilman okay. Nicholson. Nicholson, were you on the same? Or? Well, this relates to the position that Mr. Prolong was just discussing. Uh, the, you know, I'm not anxious to add any new positions to city government. I, I recognize that uh, there are places in every department where we can cut positions, where we can decline to fill positions that have not yet been filled. But I, I do think that uh, hiring an additional engineer to oversee work on which we're spending a hundred million dollars a year is a good investment. I mean, I, I would think that if we are able to hire a competent individual with appropriate experience, that it would be very likely that individual would uh, help us realize cost savings in excess of the cost of his salary. And, and so for that reason, I hope uh, my colleagues will consider supporting this measure. Thank you. All right. Sit, uh, Mayor Perkins, are you related to the same? Yeah, this okay. is related to that. Um, so it, we've been talking about, like, adding positions, and I, I want to say the conversation has been very asymmetrical because uh, my administration has been cutting a lot of costs since we came in the door, whether you're talking about contracts, whether you're talking about positions. Uh, we're going to do um, – we're going to look at, like, manning reform uh, over the next month. And um, so when we talk about adding positions, the calculus that we're doing, that we're using when adding positions or suggesting to add positions is very much how much they can save the city and if they can save the city more money to justify the amount of money we would pay them in wages. So this isn't just, hey, we're spending, spending, spending. That's not what's going on here at all. Um, so uh, all of that will clearly show at the end of the year once we start to review the budget and our expenditures. But I don't want anybody to think that we're just spending. That's not what's going on right now. Mr. Chair. Councilman Butch. Uh Do we have any, because I know as a councilman we have not seen those documents. So it's easy for me to make statements when I'm not seeing this is actually being done. Do we have, do we have that? I mean, do we have what, some like contracts that we've well, reviewed just, just, and I mean, amended? It, and it'd be nice at the end of this quarter if we yeah. could say if you could give us some type of document that says yeah. this is what I've done, yeah. this is where we're at, this is how much we've cut, because it, it'd be a lot easier for me when people call me and say you're going to tax me, <laughs> or you know, that I could say, well, let me let me send you this document and this is what we've actually cut, because there is a lot of rhetoric that goes on, mm -hmm. and and I think some of it could possibly be a breakdown between the council and the administration. And, and I would, I think that that might be the best course of action is if, if, if we are doing this and, and something came up today, I think, about the IT department and, you know, uh, and, I, and I believe we're going to try to get a report on that tomorrow, that there have been some real true savings from, yeah. from this. Um, it'd be really nice not just to hear it, but to see it, yeah. you know, on paper that this is actually going on. And then it, it makes it a lot easier for us to be able to say, hey, you know, this is really something we have to do. We are doing some cutting. Yeah. So, um, no, I, I agree with you completely. I get those same emails and phone calls. Uh, so that's, so uh, I'd ask that we, uh, at, a, at the six-month mark, and my administration is in, the, in office for six months, and I feel like I'm at six months already. Uh, at the six-month <laughs> mark, we'll, we'll get with uh, council. Yeah, six I know, years. right? I'm a, I've aged six years. Uh, at the six month mark, we'll get with Councilman Fleury and we can give a report to the Finance Committee um, on the savings up to that point. Um, but again, we're, we're having a kind of a personnel review board, wage review board, um, just internally starting next month. So, um, yeah, I want to I add that information into what we've already saved when I present it to you. 
Because right now we've got two trains going in two different directions. Oh, there we go. <laughs> on the train. All right. So you said, or, or we get back to see the train is train, but you're saying six months from January. Yes, yeah, six months. Yep, just okay. give us six months, and we'll we're good at homework assignments. So six months, I will turn in that assignment. Well, you know, and I, and I might suggest too. We talked about having meetings in other spots. Maybe we need to get together and have a meeting, maybe three meetings in in other areas of town to tell people this, where everybody mm -hmm. that might not be able to come to this meeting can hear your idea. So yep. maybe we've got three months to start planning that for the first of June. Let's start yep. looking at three different locations to to have a meeting and, and discuss where we are with the city. That's a genius plan to go to the people and talk about savings. But not at 6 like o'clock. Take the train to them. <laughs> <laughs> All right, turn it, turn it straight in. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I was consulting with the city attorney and on the prior question that was asked regarding the solid waste, um, well, actually the recycling product collection fee. Uh, we wanted you to know that and remind you that there is currently a city code section 74-31 uh, subsection H that does require a mandatory $2.50 monthly service fee be added to the customer's water and sewer bill. So if the city uh, council decided to go a different direction and not have a recycling program any longer, then that city code would need to be amended um, to remove that $2.50 service fee that's directly tied to recycling. And you said it's on the 74, where, where is that? It's uh, city code section 74-31, subsection H, and also uh, J. Okay. All right. Small pull, you had something? Mm -mm. All right. No, this train's just going to sit here on the, just going to sit here on the rails at the station. All right. We went over the ordinance in second reading and final pass. I forgot where we work. <laughs> That's that. Um, Table blood station. Which one? Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, Miss Miss Jones. Uh, we are at table legislation. Okay. There is no table legislation to be removed. Is that correct, Mr. Thompson? We don't have any. Okay. No other ordinances or appeals. We have one property standards appeal today. Four thousand ninety-five Fern. Mr. Nicholson. While Mr. Green sets up his presentation, I'll say that he's advised me that the homeowner has employed a contractor and that he expects this issue to be resolved. We saw the pictures of the last meeting. Why don't you just give us an oral report, Mr. Okay. Green, if you will? Ms. Coleman has uh, hired a contractor. Uh, she said that it can start today with a committee. Um, so what, basically what we came up with is in two weeks, you guys will see it again, and you, we can close it out there. Uh, she has, like I say, she has sent us a copy. Uh, council has a copy of it, so you know, we can... Go ahead on and go with the two weeks. And so what's the recommendation? Say it again. So Say again. The recommendation is what? Uh, wait till next council. We can close it out once uh, it's demolished. Uh, she, sh she said it should be done this week, but with the rain and whatnot, it'll at least give her those two weeks to have everything so done. I, I will move based on Mr. Green's report to postpone this matter an additional two weeks with the understanding that it will be resolved by that time. Second. There's no discussion. Please vote. Motion carries with five and two out of the time. One out of one out of time. Right. There are no other appeals today, and that's gonna be on. What's the next meeting? March twenty-six. Mm -hmm. Two weeks. Okay. 
No other appeals. Uh, Mr. Thompson. The clerk's report. I was asking, was there any other appeal? No. Okay. Any reports from Officer Board or Committee? And the clerk's report. Uh, on April the 9th, uh, there will be a United Way presentation on 211 service. Uh, we sent it around making that suggestion. Didn't hear anybody saying that they were opposed to it, so uh, we think it will come off at that time. Uh, the mayor has made several appointments. Assistant to the Director of Water and Sewer, Don Hobdy. The A&E Selection Committee, Rachel Lawler and Charles Henderson. The Workforce Development Board, Keonia Thomas Walker, Kimberly Poole, Susan Evans, uh, Patrick Harrison, uh, Sandy Semino, Katrina Early, uh, Robin Foley, Foley, and Devin McCall. Okay. Um, any questions on that in discussion? Hey, the only brief comment I'll make is that uh, I did inquire with the city attorney concerning whether members of the A&E Selection Committee uh, who serve for a, a term of four years could be removed at the pleasure of the mayor. Uh, her opinion, uh, based on the interaction of the relevant charter provisions and the ordinance creating the A&E Selection Committee, uh, is that the mayor does have the authority to remove those individuals uh, uh, at his pleasure. I, I think that's a question on which reasonable lawyers could differ, but uh, as she is a city attorney, I defer to her opinion. That may be something we want to revisit in the future with legislation. I mean, the purpose of the A&E Selection Committee, as I appreciate it, is to insulate uh, those decisions concerning the award of contracts of which it has authority from uh, political considerations uh, and having citizen members who, uh, who cannot be removed without some cause might to help us achieve that purpose of that committee. Thank you. All right. Yeah. Anybody else? Anything else? Mayor, you wasn't here earlier for uh, any uh, comments that you had. I was just no. checking to see if you had any. Yeah, and uh, yeah, just apologize for being late. I We just got back from Austin, Texas, South by Southwest. Uh, over the weekend, great trip. We uh, spoke to over 80 startups, uh, many of which didn't know where Shreveport, Louisiana was, uh, to talk to them about our community. And, um, you know, uh, we're going to continue conversations with them, so hopefully they bring their companies here uh, in the future. It's where some huge companies have started, like Twitter actually started the South by Southwest uh, Festival. So very productive trip. We also met with the dean of uh, University of Texas Medical School. Uh, to talk about our health care and uh, development corridor um, and also got some good resources uh, from that meeting. So just a very good trip overall, but um, I was an hour and a half late delayed on my flight, so that's why I walked in late. Uh, I want to acknowledge we recently lost two city employees, so I want to acknowledge them. Uh, Mark Morgan was a coding technician uh, in our SPA department and Janet Jackson, the assistant uh, to the director for water and sewage. Uh, Mrs. Jackson Funeral Service was held this morning, uh, so please join me in a moment of silence to remember each of them. Thank you. All right. This afternoon, um, officers assigned to our Community Oriented Policing Bureau uh, are assisting the Shreveport Green and Anti-Littering Campaign, known as Cover Your Loads. Uh, for safer roads by conducting a traffic enforcement operation. The operation is focusing on enforcement of unsecured loads, traveling on our highways, as well as the enforcement of loose litter ordinances uh, affecting business property owners. So they're looking out for that for people uh, spilling litter, et cetera, on our roads. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to thank council members who took the time to go and uh, spend some time with our first responders last week. Um, at the uh, Shreveport Police Department and Fire Department Award Banquets. Thank you. I was at one of them, and I remember uh, at least four council members were there. So thank you for showing your support and appreciation for what they do for us every day. Um, and I, I can't, I, I just got to do this one more time. I got to thank SPAR and Public Works, SPD, SFD for their work during the Mardi Gras season. Uh, we could not have done any of that without 
everybody, I mean, just putting in an incredible amount of hours, weekends, mornings, nights, you name it, to make sure that our community could uh, enjoy the Mardi Gras season. So I just want to thank them one last time. That's all I have, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, yeah, at the SPD banquet, I know that Councilwoman Fulham made me sit by myself on the end because she said we had a quorum if I was sitting close, so I moved over to the side. Uh, outside that, we had a, uh, a good visit with the, with the fire banquet also. Uh, Councilman Bradford came in and took about 15 pictures and took away from the media. Uh, but outside of that, we did have a good time there, so I, I like to just uh, Congratulate both of those departments for a job well done. Uh, if there's nothing else to Mr. Chairman, let me ask you. Uh, it's been customary that we at least acknowledge <laughs> those uh, those individuals that, that was up for confirmation, so they wouldn't have to come back. Are they here? I think one, two, is it three. I saw one. Um, ah, okay. Three are here. Yeah. We can. You want to call them up? I, I I just like to meet them. Yeah. Okay. That sounds fine with me. Which 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 three? Who are here? We have Rachel Lawler here. Rachel. We have uh, Charles Henderson here, and we have Don Ivey. Okay. You want to, Councilman? You want to talk to him today? Well, I mean, we we we've had uh, different approaches, but uh, I mean, the the, the 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 standard has been we don't want them to have to come back over and over again. So I mean, if they're here, we we wanted to at least meet them and and uh, because Council, we, I'm sure they'd appreciate that, uh, Chairman. No, I'm fine with that. I know that I didn't know if Hobby was prepared. I know he's not on this one upcoming, but that's up to the, the council. I'm, I'm fine with that. But well, that was, that was, well just we the he's on the clerk's report, Chairman. At the, I think he's for next meeting. Right. I think it was for the next. I could be wrong. Mm -hmm. I mean, even if they come next time. So those appointments for the various uh, auxiliaries, boards, commissions, are they, are they, those that are here, will you come forward, please? Ms. Lowell, Ms. Rachel Lowell? Yeah, hi. Step up just to the red line, please. You can lower the mic if you need to. That's fine. How's that? Yeah. I think that A little lower? <laughs> just where it's comfortable for you, that's fine. Okay. All right. Councilman Brown. Yeah. Hello, good evening, and hey. uh, thank you for coming. Um, yeah, thanks for having me. Give us. Give us a little bit about yourself and some of some your experience and what think what what do you feel make you um, uh, a good candidate for this for the position of serving on the any com committee uh, sure so um, without really knowing the full description of the committee that um, I'm being appointed to I would tell you that uh, I'm from Northwest Louisiana okay. uh, I'm a local boutique real estate broker owner uh, of a company here in town um, I spent six years in construction development and construction management mm -hmm. um, and I hope that that uh, those services in Northwest Louisiana helped me to be a good candidate for this committee. Oh, certainly, that, that, is, that is a good uh, resume to, to, to be. Thank you. I think would be very instrumental in helping direct that, uh, that committee. Uh, have, you, have, you, have you attended a, a one of those committees in the past? No? I have not. Okay, but you're looking forward to working with it? Absolutely. <coughs> okay. All right, well, thank you. Good evening. My name is Charles Henderson from 3887 Winter Park, Shreveport, Louisiana. So, Mr. Henderson, same question. What, what, what is your profession, and what makes you eligible for such a such a role in in, in this committee? Right now, Brother Bradford, uh, my profession is I'm retired. <laughs> <laughs> I want to be that way one day. <laughs> that's the best thing going. <laughs> But my, my experience, I have spent over 35 years in the HV industry, uh, serving as, looking at plans to spec jobs, uh, bidding on jobs, working in the construction field, uh, overseeing projects that's had to do with architect and engineer, and sometimes even correcting their mistakes. Oh. <laughs> okay. Well, anyway, I... Uh, I guess I need to let the council know I know you. Been knowing you for 
50 years. Yeah, classmate. <laughs> classmate. Yeah. But, uh, but thank you again, and I, I appreciate uh, you willing to serve in this position. Okay. Uh, thank you, Brother Brown. Right. I appreciate. No, I just want to say I appreciate both of you uh, for your willingness to serve uh, the city. All right. Thank both of you. Thank, thank you. you again. Okay. Thank you. Anything else, Councilman Brown? Yeah. Is he coming down? Do you want to see the third candidate? No. Yeah. Well, he's a, he's up for a position, right? Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, sure, sure. I mean, again, I, I didn't know if you wanted to see. No, nah, again, I, 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 I would like to not invite them. You know, if they hear, then we need to deal. You know. No, I was saying he's just on the next one. It didn't matter to me, but I know I he's at every he's meeting, so more, is it? just he's not. It's not. He's not on to the next. Next, next time, not this weeks. one coming up. Two weeks. Yeah. The, the, the others are too, right? Well, we've, no, I mean, oh, so, yeah. Chair, we've done that before. Are. Confirmation would be in two weeks, but in the past, you've at you all have had an opportunity to ask questions during appointment as well. Right. So we've yeah, I know. That's what I'm ways, saying. So you know, if they're here, we, we, we usually at least interview them, and then they don't have to come back no more. Yes, yeah. exactly. It's fine with me. Mm -hmm. So, so much here. That's the reason why I'm saying it's a, it's up to you to make the decision, but you. There has been. Okay. Well, I mean, I don't want, you know, if, the, if it's the pleasure of the council, I mean, let's just talk to him and he don't have to come back no more. Mr. Hobbit, come on, let's, let's uh, get on the hot seat. <laughs> what you say about, what you say about the not train? It's not six o'clock yet. <laughs> we, we, they like, say, we're going to get later today, <laughs> council <laughs> lady. The boat hadn't shipped out yet. <laughs> the boat's still at the dock. Good afternoon, council mayor. Ms. Hobbit, you've been appointed to. Assistant Director of Water and Sewer, is that, is that right? Give us a little bit about yourself. Tell us, tell us about your background. As a young adult, my favorite sandwich was a BLT. With the BLT, you, you got your carbohydrates, you got your, your uh, vegetables, and you got your protein. Look at, look at Council Lady Fuller when you're talking I'm all about. looking at you right <laughs> <laughs> What I bring to you is something like a BLT, but I bring you an HILT. <clears throat> I bring you history. I bring you, let me look at my notes. Pastor told me to always bring my notes with me so I don't make mistakes. I bring you integrity, I bring you loyalty, and I bring you trustworthiness. I also bring wisdom, knowledge, and experience. I started with the CDS Shreveport as a bookkeeper. Uh, with my commitment, dedication, I was promoted from a bookkeeper to a, a fiscal coordinator. My continued commitment and de dedication, I was eventually promoted to Assistant Director of Urban Development. It is now called Community Development. I've uh, worked in a number of capacities with the City of Shreveport, including Chief of Operations for, I mean, sorry, Administration for the Department of Parks and Recreation. I've worked in the private sector as a consultant as well as a uh, developer. I've worked with one hospital firm where I was responsible for going out, doing acquisitions and purchasing as well. Uh, I oversaw, oversaw the uh, pharmaceutical operation in the Dallas, Texas area. So I bring with me a varied amount of experience. Yeah, well, I didn't realize your depth of city uh, experience working for the city of Shreveport. Yeah. I also was a manager of a credit union and worked as director of business diver diversity for University Health. So hold on a second, Mayor. Now this is assistant to the director and not an assistant director. Tell, so have the job description been developed for this position? Is, uh, yes. yes, it was the the previous person's job description. The title didn't match what they were actually doing. Um, so this title actually matches more closely to what they're actually doing every day. The okay. the previous there were two superintendents of, um, I think it was customer service. Yeah, it was two superintendents of customer service, but the second superintendent of customer service was the assistant to the water and sewage director. They weren't in the customer service center. There was nothing pertaining to like what they were actually doing. Had nothing to do with the title. So we just changed the title to better match what they were actually doing. Okay, so it's not a new position. Is not a new, so. Nope, not a new position at all. Okay, okay, and uh, he's been provided with those duties and responsibilities. Yes, yes. And and you familiar and, and you feel confident. Yes, sir. All right, thank you. Thanks, sir. All right. Um, I just want to have you have you met with uh, Miss Bellaston? I have. You, 
got a good relationship with Miss Pat? Absolutely. Well, Barbara kind of runs a tight ship from my understanding, so I ain't know if you if you're ready for that, but if you are, I'm fine with that. <laughs> we can handle it. Okay. All right. Okay, that's 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 what I had. Anyone else? Okay. Thank you, Mr. Holliday. Thank you. All right. I think that was it. Um, if there's nothing else, then this meeting is uh, done. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> wait, wait. <laughs> wait. The drum and grog. The train's gone. 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 The